Good morning. My name is Jay Smith, and I'm here today from Leap of Faith Worship Center in McCungee, Pennsylvania. God bless everybody. Um, let us just bow our heads and lift our hearts to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just come before your throne in the name of your Son, the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I just ask today that you heal every hurt. And Lord, I ask that you forgive every sin. Lord, anoint my, my mind and my heart and my lips to say what you want me to say today. And I ask these things and pray these things through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today I want to talk about several things, and I, I'm going to probably jump around a little bit, but please stay with me. I'm going to be talking first uh, a little bit about the Holy Ghost, a lot of it about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and then I'm going to go into apologetics, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that we could be doing now. There's a harvest that's waiting to come, and we're going to talk about that. First of all, I want to talk about the things the Holy Spirit does, and I'm kind of I'm going to rifle these out, but stay with me. He he convicts the word of sin, righteous judgment, John three sixteen. He guides us into the all truth, John sixteen thirteen. He regenerates us, God three five eight and Titus three five. He glorifies and testifies of Christ, John fifteen twenty six and sixteen fourteen. He reveals Christ to us, John 16, 14, 15. He leads us, Romans 8, 14. He sanctifies us, Thessalonians 2, 13. He empowers us, Luke 14, 14. He fills us, Ephesians 5, 18, Acts 2, 4. He teaches us to pray, Romans 8, 26 through 27, Jude 1, 20. He bears witness in us that we are children of God, Romans 8, 16. He produces in us the fruit of evidence of his work and presence, Galatians 5.22-23. He distributes spiritual gifts and manifestations, his presence and through the body, 1 Corinthians 12.4, Hebrews 2.4. He anoints us for his ministry. He washes us and renews us, Titus 3.5. He brings unity and oneness to the body, Ephesians 4.23. And there's more. I have no stories to tell today. Um, I'm not a storyteller, but I am going to be talking about what God has given me. Um, 2 Timothy 4.4, um, reading this from the NIV, New International Version. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside and listen to myths. I'm talking about the world today and where we are today with false doctrines, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, long, a little bit later. In Daniel 12.4, in the King James Version, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And we'll be talking about where we are going into eschatological times or end times. Um, and more on that is in Zechariah. And this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike, all people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. And my, my grandfather, who was a farmer, probably or maybe his father, wouldn't know exactly what that was or maybe understand it to times today in 2012 and going into the 21st century. But when we have a nuclear blast and there's a holocaust, if it happens and we're near it, that's what will happen to us. The heat will be extreme to a level that we, it's hard to believe. It will melt us. It will melt our eyes out. It will melt our mouth. It will melt us. We'll be going vaporized within seconds. It was foretold by God to Zechariah. Revelation 9.16 says, Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. You know, when John was talking about that, he said he heard the number. Right now in China, they have 200 million 
troops ready to go. And we now know that there are other countries around the world that aren't too friendly with the United States and other countries, especially countries that believe in Jesus Christ. Having said that, as a prelude to what I'm going to be talking about next, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a slideshow that maybe will explain it a little bit easier and give you a visual idea of presentation. And the first slide says, it's from 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And I'll be talking a little bit later about sanctification. Uh, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that you have in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. The next question I have is, this is an interesting question, especially for people who are sports fans. One of four players voted MVP four times, and according to Winshare's formula, is the greatest catcher of all times. He's quoted constantly saying, it ain't bragging if you can do it. And if you said, Yogi Bear, you were right. I think about people that I know within my church and people that I've met that are ready to go out and talk to people and try to gather the harvest in. And the people who have never heard the saving grace of Jesus Christ or people uh, who haven't been to church in 20 years and maybe want to come back or people who are not believers, they don't understand who God is, they've never read from scripture, they've never had anyone talk to them. And yet there are people that I do know and that actually aren't prepared to do that. They're not ready. They don't know the answers to the questions that people will have. And that's one of the things we want to talk about today. Apologetics. Um, apologetics it comes from the Greek apology, and it means a defense. So when these people are talking to you, and there's someone who doesn't believe in God, as we know him, doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, or thinks that God is everywhere, um, apologetics is a, a study that we do and understanding that we do through the Holy Spirit and also uh, something that we uh, will watch um, maybe in, uh, on TV like today or we will sit in a church and pastors will minister to us and educate us or the Holy Spirit when we're reading our scripture. What I'm told to do today is to do th thought starters with everyone that is within earshot or can see this, this telecast today. Apologetics is a study of scripture, it's a study of uh, the defense that we have and understanding that we have that we can help people uh, usher, get ushered into God's kingdom. Apologetics sometimes means that it's a uh, studying a biblical manus manuscript for, trans that for transmission. Sometimes it's reading uh, the Bible. Maybe it's the Old Testament. Maybe it's the New Testament. We don't under understand. It means studying that until we have an understanding or going to someone who has a foundation in uh, God's word. Sometimes it's philosophy or biology. Biology and apologetics is important. Or mathematics, and we'll go into that a little bit further. Sometimes it's mathematics of our life and the way things are made. Our revolution, uh, when people are evolutionists, they say we, there was a big bang that happened and we crawled out of the slime and we turned into people. And logic, uh, just the logical things, the common sense things. You know, I, my title of this talk today is uh, Apologetics from a Farmer. I was raised on a farm. And the farmers that raised me, we sat 18 people around my table at dinner time and uh, read the Bible every day from that table. And the, um, the way that it was read was taken right from scripture. We didn't add to it, we didn't take away, we just accepted what it said. And a lot of times we didn't understand it. Just talking about um, books and what people understand and what we accept. Uh, the New Testament comparison with other historical te texts. Oops. 
Okay, we're there. Slide, next slide, please. The New Testament comparison with other historical texts. Um, if uh, you had any study, if you were in high school or sometimes in college, it is Her Her Herodotus, uh, supposed to be, or is called sometimes the father of uh, the ages, or the, he is the um, kind of the benchmark for what has been written in our history. Um, his books were written at uh, 400 years before Christ, uh, and looking down into other uh, books of history, we'll find books that are accepted by uh, society and all different societies all over the world that were written and one or two or three, and in this case, it was eight books that were written. And they were written 13, this particular book, I mentioned Herodotus, he, it was 1,300 years after he lived, and it was accepted. It's accepted in all the major uh, places of study, colleges, and universities around the world. And when we talk about scripture, when people look at a, or get a Bible and they talk about our scripture, what we read, the Holy Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, it was written between 400, I mean 40 and 100 A.D., 40 and 100 A.D., and it was, we had full manuscripts of Scripture 130 years after Christ lived on the New Testament. Um, it was written in Greek and Latin and other languages on three different continents, and the time span between all of that happening from the Old Testament was 900 years, the New Testament was 300 years in all those places with that many copies, 5,000 copies distributed throughout the world. Right now, there's more Bibles printed and in circulation than any other book, all the books put together in almost every language in the world now. Or it might include, apologetics might include um, astrophysics, um, The Darling of the Galaxies, which is known as M51, and we'll put it on slide. You can go to the next one. Again, there we go. This is a, a spin galaxy, a whirlpool galaxy, that uh, was seen by the Hubble telescope once it left Earth's atmosphere. And it's one of the first things that they found. Now, the spin galaxy, it's unusual that they are pointed toward Earth where we can see it flat. Most of them are like sombreros that you can't see head on. M51, we can see it head on. And a lot of science, most scientists don't like talking about it because, as you can see in the center, there's a cross. Now, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we, it is said in Scripture that there will be a sign of Jesus, and there's a couple places that it says sign. It's not plural, it's a sign. And this is one of the signs. The cross is a universal sign for Jesus Christ. This whirlpool galaxy, M51, is a sign of Jesus. And there's nothing that anybody could take away from it or add to it. It is what it is. It's a cross that is just amazing. They don't know how or why it, ha it is that way. We, uh, we do know that God created everything. He has names for every star that makes up that sign. Apologetics can sometimes be easy. As simple as sharing the gospel or uh, charisma, or simply giving an answer to the question about Jesus or a Bible passage. So when we are talking to someone, maybe it is a, a coworker, an employee, or maybe uh, someone at a fast food store or something like that, and we have an opportunity to witness to them. Uh, sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it's easy as sharing uh, scripture verses that they knew or heard, or other times it becomes very detailed. Um, I had the opportunity and, uh, to serve as a Gideon uh, for a while, for a decade or so. And I remember the first time I went on a college campus and started to distri distribute te New Testaments. And it was there that I found out how much I really didn't know. When I started out and I was talking about being ready in the science and in biology and physics and 
and knowledge that we have in translating the Bible and what it means, it's important because these are the questions that basic people will ask. If a Martian landed on Earth and he wanted to know about Jesus Christ, he would start asking the same questions. Who was he? How was he? How did it work? How do you know that the scripture's real? How do you know what it means? Are you interpreting it the right way? And so forth. So it can, it can be as easy as explaining a scripture verse that you're familiar with, or it can be a modern day co combat zone on college campuses. Slide. Again. One more. Um, these are actual pictures of men and women that are working on today's college campuses. And all of them, none of them are Christian campuses. They're all secular type cam campuses. And it's difficult. And the men and women who do that take a lot of heat. They take this a lot of problems. They get cackled. They get yelled at. They, people throw stuff at them and things like that. Um, it's hard today. Next, next slide. Do a quick in. Okay. Um, we have people who have had problems, and they talk about their own problems, whatever they might be, and try to bring people in, letting them know that when you come into the body of Christ, we're willing. Our acceptance is everyone, just like Christ accepted everyone. Our acceptance is everyone. There's no one that's excluded. And you have to be ready to take the questions and take responsibility for your own knowledge and what you learn and to be in God's word every day and start to understand these things. The last thing that Jesus said to the disciples, you know, we read about uh, the Last Supper and we read about uh, Jesus leaving, and, but the last, very last thing he said to the disciples when they were together was, go out and preach to the world. Preach the gospel and the good news to everyone in every corner of the world. And that was the last commandment that we got from him, the last bit of instruction we got from him while he was still here on earth. Go, tell people, and tell people who I am, what I am, what, what uh, is in scripture, and how they can live with me forever and ever in paradise. Why, what, when, and where? First line, Cliff. Okay. Christians need apologetics because it helps us to know our faith. Um, it's interesting when you are put to a situation where you're one-on-one -on -one with people and they want to know about scripture. Uh, we use apologetics because it helps us personally know our, our faith. If we are uh, studying, being prepared and ready to tell people what is in uh, scripture, we have to know it ourselves. And what happens consequently, we're going to start learning more. And the more knowledge that we have, the easier it's going to become to be able to do that and handle ourselves. So start to get into Bible study. Start to talk to your pastor. Uh, find a mentor that can help you and understand someone that has uh, been in the word and are a mature Christian and you trust what they say as being um, true and accurate. Um, it helps us to know our faith. We need to shore up the areas we are weakest in. When asked to, to be able to describe wh what the Trinity is, um, there's probably a good amount of uh, people who believe in Jesus and are Christians that are watching this telecast now uh, be able to describe the Trinity. Know the, the two natures of Jesus Christ, what they are. His physical resurrection, the differences between justification and sanctification. Um, I'll give you a hint on one. Justification is just as if I died. You know, and if you're not sure about sanctification, find out about it. Apologetics helps us to define and defend the truth of the gospel. Biblical truths, biblical knowledge. Next slide. Apologetics, I like this one. Apologetics is an attempt to keep people out of hell. Uh, the Bible acknowledges that we have all have sinned and we cannot keep God's law perfectly. Um, the wages of sin are death. Those not covered by the blood of Christ will agonize in the lake of fire forever, and we've all heard that. 
But we need to tell them that sin is real. God is real. And that breaking God's law has a consequence. John 8, 24 says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In 1 Peter 2, 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we may die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds we are healed. Now, I know we understand that, but you have to understand what that means and be able to explain it. And the first thing that I said when I started talking was um, I quoted scripture from 1 Peter 3.15, which is always be ready to give an answer to whoever asks what is the hope that you have in you and be able to do it with understanding, patience, tactfulness, but most of all, compassion. Um, it's important because it may be the one and only time that anyone would hear what you're saying. You may never see them again. They may never hear that again. So it's important to know these things. We need apologetics in today's distorted, politically incorrect world and our world culture. Um, televangelists, um, and we've heard televangelists recently, and especially in the past decade, and the scandals that have happened, both sexually and, and monetarily, it's a disgrace to Christianity, and, I, and we all know that, and hopefully we're beyond a lot of that. And I guess you know some and seen some and probably read about them too, and we're appalled when it happens. The Catholic Church uh, recently has had a problem with scandals and some of the things that's happened to them. Uh, and the, you know, the, the many have to uh, you know, sacrifice what's going on for the few that have made problems. On top of that, the media is very biased against Christianity. You will see negative opinions on Christianity promoted everywhere. We saw some of it in this last election that we had. Um, so we have to be careful and we have to know what the truth is. Um, the, the other thing is we need apologetics because um, there is a constant threat of apostasy. Um, pluralistic uh, thinking, pluralistic meaning that um, it's, one God, it's one God. We all believe in, a, in one God. Well, we do not believe in one God. Um, you know, we talk, people think when they're praying to uh, certain names of God that it's that the true and actual God. That's not so. Some of them are not the God that we know. Um, so we have to be careful. We have to be able to explain that when we're talking to someone that's in a faith that uh, is not a true and actual faith and they don't even really understand who they're praying to or who the God is. So we need apologetics to be able to be uh, ready to be able to answer that and, and make known who the true God is and why. There are uh, church actual denominations. Uh, there's a denomination that actually paid uh, a fund, funded in the very beginning in the year 2000, $500,000 for uh, to have a gay movement within their church and have gays um, uh, in the pulpit and couple, gay couples in the pulpit and so forth. Um, in Romans 1, 18 through 32, it says absolutely not. You know, God doesn't want that. That's not how his creation is. And we want to draw these people, people who are gay and people who are fighting that. Um, our churches are like hospitals. And it's not just the good people who come in. Good people do come in. But it's not meant, it's meant for everyone to come in and find out. You know, again, it, God's last thing, his last command to us was to go out and reach people and bring them to him. And it means everyone. It's not just the people who are good and the people who were raised in the church. It's people who have been on drugs and can't get off. It's people who have problems with alcohol. It's people who are lying and can't stop lying. It's people who gamble. It's people, uh, you know, whatever we do as a people, we're, we have all these things facing us every day. On the, in the newspaper, on billboards, on TV, in the movies, everywhere. We fight it every day.
We need apologetics because of the many false teachings that are out there. Um, uh, and you know, I, I have to say it, Mormonism teaches that God used to be a man on another world, that he brought one of his goddesses with him to this world, and that they produce a spirit offspring that are born into human babies, and that you have the potential of becoming God, a god in your own world. Um, that we don't, that's not what is in our, our doctrine uh, in Christianity. Jehovah's Witnesses teach that there is no trinity, that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, that there is no hell, and that 144,000 people will, will go to heaven. Atheism denies God's existence, openly attacks Christianity, is gaining ground in public life. More and more people are becoming atheists. They believe that there's science is, you know, the Big Bang Theory, and that we've actually evolved, and there really wasn't a God that created all this. And when you run into those people, when you talk to those people, you should be ready to give a reason why you have the faith and trust in God that you have. The dead uh, that um, a lot of people, spiritualists, want to uh, communicate with people who have died. And uh, there's witchcraft and things like that. And they preach against um, Christianity and the real true God and, ha and uh, how spirituality really is. Even within the Christian church, there are false teachings. teachings. We can see that from both within the Christian church and outside of it. False teachings are boomerang believers, non-believers, and they're all over the world. So, as a believer, if you're watching this, what do you think? How, do you, how are you grading yourself? How do you grade yourself? Uh, next slide. Next, uh, you know what? Go back to that, please. I missed that. Immorality. Immorality in our world. If you don't have any belief in anything, if you're not believing in God, um, where's your moral compass at? Where's your salvation? Um, you know if. If, you don't, if, you, if there's no moral compass in you, you probably would believe anything. And a lot of people that you will talk to or see or run into are in that phase. Um, they believe in good karma. They believe that um, the works that they do here is what's going to get them in heaven. And as Christian believers, and I've, and I've basically been talking to Christian believers today to go out and evangelize in their own way. But what about those people? You know, uh, they may not be uh, in any of the other categories, but um, they're still lost. And how are you going to approach them? What are you going to be saying to them? On, and lastly, slide. Oh, go back. <laughs> Do you personally think that Christianity is under attack in the world today? And I brought up some points and I kind of rifled through them. And I rifled through scripture, I rifled through the Holy Spirit where we saw him and what he does for us. But what are you thinking while you're in, the, in church and you're listening to ministers give the word? A lot of times, it's to go out. It's giving you information to be able to go out and reach other people. It's, it's arming you with information that you can be using to draw people into salvation with God. Basically, and the ultimate, is we unite in church to fortify ourselves, to learn things, to um, grow, uh, to a lot of times satisfy the hunger of what we want to learn and our knowledge, and we go to places where we can get that. Um, but where are you at? What do you think is happening? And slide. Okay. 
slide. What are you doing about it? What do we do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, are we watching shows like this one? Are we listening to pastors? Are we consulting our, the pastors of our church? Uh, if you never believed in, in God or you're seeking, who have you gone to? This is a good time to find out. It's a good time to search and find a, find a church. If someone has talked to you before, it's uh, a good time to approach that person and find out what it's about. If you have a Bible in, at your house and it's something that you use to make a promise on and you never, and you never read it, you've never opened it up, this is a time to start to look into a Bible and start to find out where do I start? Do I start in the beginning? Do I start at the end? Do I start in the middle? What do I start reading? What, what sounds good? It's not usually a good idea. Um, when was the last time we gave a track to someone? When was the last time we invited someone to go to our church? You know, too often uh, we have neighbors that are, while they're grooming their lawn on Sunday, we're in church being fed. Um, and a lot of times we think, well, I want to worry about my wife and my children. If you're married and you have children, you want to make sure that they go. But when was the last time you reached out to one of your family members? What about them? What about your sister? What about your brother? What if, what if you're a Christian and you have unruly children? Well, I have children. Uh, we have four children. And uh, two of them are out of the house. What about them? Do they believe? When was the last time we talked to them about the saving grace of Jesus Christ and what it means? Always be ready to give a reason why. Uh, I'm going to go back to people that we have contact with, the people that we work with. When was the last time we invited someone that we work with to come to our church? You know, when was the last time that there was a Bible study in our church? When was the last time we participated in something that was uh, social in our church and invite someone to come? When was the last time that we looked at tracts and we read Bible tracts that we understood what they meant and we looked up the verses to make sure we really understood it? Uh, when was the last time we went online and we Googled something that had to do with apologetics? Apologetics is the defense of our faith. So when was the last time we looked to see how do we actually defend our faith? Um, this, is a, this was a tough sermon to teach for me because it was set in a scholastic kind of a setting. It wasn't something where I just was able to flow through and preach it. This is what God gave me today to talk about. And it's difficult because it is different things. It's scripture, it's knowledge of scripture, it's different people, it's every walk of life, it's everyone that we will come in contact with, and I'm trying to kind of shotgun blast at, in one 45 minute segment all the things that we can run into. Take, if you're gonna take away something from what we're talking about today, take away the fact that if you, if you are a Christian, and if you are a Christian, and if you are sold out to Jesus Christ, this is a wake-up call. For me, there is no tomorrow. And if you pick up a newspaper, you read it, it reads right out of what Scripture says. And we are coming into the final times, and everyone preaches on that, and we are. You know, if you watch televangelists on TV, a lot of times what they're talking about are the eschatological times, the end times, and eschatology. Well, we're there. We are there now. Um, the next slide. All right. What are you doing about it? When is the last time you witnessed to anyone or invited someone to church? If not us, if we don't do it as Christians, then who will? Who will do it? Um, and the next slide. Next. Really, if it's not us, who will do it? Who will do it? And just to go back over some of the things that we, I just want to just circle back around to what we were talking about. Second Timothy said, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside and turn to myths. If we don't get to them, they're going to believe whatever story that they hear. If we don't talk to them, uh, they could believe in a science. They could believe in things that we know are no, not biblically based. If we turn away from them, 
they will be lost. They'll be cast into a lake of fire. You know, when we, um, at, the, at the last time, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 9 through 11 says that um, we're going to have to account for the things that we did as Christians. We'll be called into heaven as a Christian. And then the wood, hay, and stubble versus the gold, silver, and jewels will be in heaven. We'll see them. Uh, those who were saved and went to church on Sunday and uh, maybe went to the affairs of church when it happened and participated in everything in church uh, and never one time witnessed to anyone or brought anyone into church, um, you could be wood, you could be hay and stubble. Uh, the, the people who went out and uh, evangelized their neighborhood, evangelized where they worked, went on mission trips. Um, these are the people who are going to be the, have the gold crowns and the, and the, and the silver and the, and the jewels to lay at the feet of our Savior. Um, the wood, hay, and stubble people, it's going to take them uh, a few years to get that scent off of their, their clothes when we're in heaven. And we'll know who they are. Um, if you are a Christian and, and you're uh, proud to be one and you realize that you uh, are sold out to Jesus Christ and that you are saved and you expect to live eternity in heaven with Jesus, remember there, there will be a Bema um, uh, award ceremony and you'll be there and you'll have the opportunity and everything that you did for Jesus and everything that you missed out on will be shown to you. Every mistake that we made. Now, I'm rusty at this kind of presentation. I know I lot of, made a lot of mistakes. It's nervous for me to do that. But on one-on-one, -on -one, I'm, a, I'm a tiger. I'm an evangelist when I talk to people. And I have a heart. Start to soften your heart up uh, for people that you know. Soften your heart up just like they're your own children or your brother and your sister, because they are. And one of the things that I do not want to do is spend my eternity thinking about the neighbor who I asked two or three times to come to church with me on Sunday and knowing that he will be at a place that's going to be unbelievable. He will be in a place that, uh, you know, Scripture says there will be gnawing of teeth and there will be constant pain. And they will not know who Jesus Christ is. They won't know that there's a God. They'll know that they may have a wife or they may have a spouse. They may know who their relatives are while they're there for eternity. But they will have no recollection. They will not know who God is. They won't know. We have the opportunity today. As I was talking this morning with pastors. How many, how many Christmases do we have? How many Thanksgivings do we have? You know, we had Thanksgiving just passed a couple days ago. And we were thankful for so many things and the things that we had in our lives and the things, the good things that happened to us. Well, we'll be spending eternity with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it'll be unbelievable. You have to be a spirit to be able to stand it, to be able to take it. I don't want to be an eternity, and I hope you don't either, brothers and sisters in, in the fellowship of Jesus. I hope that we're not in heaven together and thinking about the people that we know. You know, Scripture says we will be known as we are known. And we'll know God. Every, every part of God we will know will be in front of him. And remember, you know, heaven's going to be a noisy place. There's going to be people shouting and screaming. You're going to be hearing millions and millions of angels saying, holy, 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 you are worthy. And we're going to be hearing that. And it's going to be an amazing place. We... We don't even know. Scripture says we don't even have an idea of everything that's going to happen and all the good that's going to happen. And we won't share that with people. But do we really believe it? Do we really in our heart of hearts believe it? Are we going to uh, watch our neighbors and our friends and the people that we work with that we really like, the guy that's on the bowling team, and we didn't take one minute to say, hey, listen, there's somebody I want to talk to you about. His name's Jesus. And there's a time and a place that I want to talk to you about. And I want to read some scripture to you. And I want you to take a look at this and just learn about this. You know, sometimes it takes a lot of, a lot of guts to do it. 
I'm asking you to step out in faith. I'm asking you to go to your neighbor. Go to a relative. You know, I talk to my brothers in church, and they talk about their children and how difficult they are, and it's like they fell away from the church, and they're married now, and they have children, and they're hoping that their grandchildren will start to come to church. Now's the time. There may not be a tomorrow. You know, Jesus can come back any time. Most of the things that we know in Scripture and the way that we interpret it, we're there. We are there. And what's going on around the world Everything is leading up to us. Jesus said, you will not know exact, the exact moment when I'm coming back. But he said, we will know the season. We are in that season. We're in that season now. Now is the time. You know, it's funny. I, I, it's not funny. It's serious. But we talked about, Zechariah said, and this, shall, there's, and this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all people who fought against Jerusalem. The flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. You know, we read the paper now about the argument about Armadinejan having nuclear weapons. And he's friends with other powers, the power from the north, the bear. You know, he's, he's friends with the people in Russia. He's friends with people in France. Uh, he was part of a, a, you know, a world group uh, against Jerusalem and the United States and Christians. They study that. They study to, uh, you know, if you do not become part of their faith, that they want to kill us. It's true. It's the truth. We read about it. Um, you know, the explanation in Zechariah 14.12 is what happens when an atomic bomb hits. Well, we're there. We're there. These countries, uh, within months probably, will have nuclear capability. And their capabilities will be directed toward Jerusalem. You know, I talked about M51. Scientists right now are starting to say, hey, the Milky Way could be like the center of all this. The Milky Way could be the center of all the other galaxies. It seems like it's the center. Well, now they're starting to say, well, it is the center. And then they find whole galaxies like M51 that has a cross in the middle of it. You know, and, I, and the scientists that are agnostics or they don't believe that there is a God are starting to think, well, well maybe there is a God. You know, that could be one of your neighbors, actually. So now they're saying that the Milky Way may be the center of the universe and if the Milky Way is the center of the universe, we know that our solar system that we're in is the center of the Milky Way, pretty close as far as we can tell. We're in the center of that. So apologetically, we are in the center, potentially, of the known universe that we can see. In the center of the Milky Way, which is our Earth, which is the fourth planet, which is in the center of our solar system. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? You might think that somebody had a plan to do that. And then in the center of our earth could be where Jesus is going to come back and reign from. You know, it could very well be Jerusalem. So now we're thinking that the center of the universe, the center of the Milky Way, the center of our world that we know is Jerusalem. Revelation 19.16 says the number of the army of the horsemen numbered 200 million. It's just ironic, I think that the number of troops that are on the ground now, we, key, we hear the key word, we hear the words now, boots on the ground. They have two million soldiers on the ground. We already knew that because Revelation said it. And he said it again. He says, and I heard them say, I heard him say that when he was writing that. He heard them. He heard right. Two million was probably, he couldn't even imagine what that number was of people. And guess where we're going to end up? You know, there's an Armageddon. Christians are cheering Jesus' return, and other people think it's going to be something that's going to be devastating and just unbelievable to take. I'm going to close with this prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I have preached what you've given to me. And before I start, I ask that you would anoint my mind, but anoint my heart, Lord and anoint what I was going to say. 
I've given the word that you wanted me to give. And now, Lord, it's up to you to fill the hearts with your Holy Spirit. And I pray and ask these things through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives forever and ever. Amen. I'll tell you what. I have never been...